Uh, thank you very much for joining my session. Um, today I'm going to talk in this session about what is the AWS Well-Architected Framework. Now the Well-Architected Framework is really intended to help people implement their solutions in the cloud. And I'm going to take you through what it actually means and why it is important and how well developed the well architected framework already is to assist organizations to implement um, their solutions within the cloud. But one of the key things um, that you need to understand is that the well architected framework was developed by um, Amazon. Um, the first edition of it already came out in 2006. Um, so it's now almost 20 years, well, just a few years short of 20, uh, 20 years. But let me take you through that. First of all, for those of you who don't know me yet, I'm Kobus Burgers, the Managing Director of NetCB. And as you can see on the screen, I'm actually a certified cloud practitioner for AWS. Um, I'm just before I start, I must mention that uh, when it comes to the educational framework and the ability to learn about AWS, it's one of the most comprehensive platforms I've ever encountered by many vendors. Um, they've got such a wealth of live training sessions, in-person training sessions, which unfortunately I see many vendors are busy scaling down significantly. AWS still does a lot of in-person training sessions and live training sessions, not merely on the bar training sessions, as well as um, what they call the AWS Skills Builder that um, makes use of gameplay to guide you through typical scenarios and then you need to build the solutions live within the AWS framework. So the practical experience you get is, is really, really significant within their environment. So let's start. Now, first of all, um, their framework is obviously um, unique to AWS, but we can also apply a lot of the principles to the Azure platform. Um, uh, at NetCB, we've done both environments. Um, we um, have an implementation on the um, um, Azure platform as well as on the AWS platform. But after going through the AWS training, um, it was so much simpler to uh, make use of the Azure platform, but the design in fact, uh, basically copied a lot of the terminology and uh, principles that AWS already developed um, and made, even made use of the same terminology within their own environment. Well, one of the things that what the framework helps you to do is to understand the pros and cons while building in the cloud. Um, it already will guide you through the process of um, using the uh, correct approach. They've got a vast array of tools that assist you during the process, um, as well as highlighting the pitfalls you may fall into, such as cost escalation, etc while you're building solutions in your uh, cloud. And quite often they know that it will be a hybrid cloud implementation. It also allows you to apply best practices. Um, through um, such so many years of experience, they've already gained a lot of um, information and details on what not to do and, and what is the best way of accomplishing certain architect, architectural design mechanisms. Um, as I mentioned, it was established through uh, almost 20 years of experience and it is being constantly updated. Um, 
the most recent update came out a couple of months ago. And it is also intended to be used by um, those in technology roles and various technology roles. Um, your uh, seat, uh, chief technology officers, um, architects, um, you know, developers, and even the operations team members. So across the board, they insist that every person involved in building these cloud solutions need to have a deep understanding of the well-architected framework. One of the things that you also need to understand when it we start dealing with, especially AWS, but it is uh, can basically be applied to each and every cloud provider. And uh, on the Amazon side, they refer to this as the shared responsibility model, because there's a clear distinction that they make between what they are responsible for and what the customer is responsible for. And it's very important that people understand this. Quite often we find that people have this notion, oh, we're going to move our stuff in the cloud so we don't need to worry about security. We no longer need to worry about our uh, backups, etc. Those are all misconceptions. You need to look at the cloud but almost as an extension of your existing data center. The only difference is you no longer need to be responsible for the actual physical infrastructure, the hardware, um, where the services will be available, um, databases, networking, the storage, the compute power, etc., and also um, the provisioning of certain software that um, AWS will take care of. Um, so the, their primary responsibility is security of the cloud. That's very important to understand it. As a customer, you are responsible for your client side data encryption data integrity, authentication, your server-side encryption, file system and or data, your network traffic, protection, encryption, your operating systems, your firewall configurations, that's your responsibility. So the, you can already see the misconceptions people have about the cloud. There's still a huge responsibility on the customer the platform, the applications you're running, your identity and access management, you are responsible for that. It's not the cloud provider's responsibility, it's the customer's responsibility. So you must understand, even if you are currently on premise and think, okay, by moving to the cloud, we will be able to half the size of our ICT services team, et cetera, that ain't gonna happen. It is a question of transitioning the skills of your existing ICT teams to be able to manage the systems that you're now also going to run in the cloud as well. A lot of the existing principles will still be applied. And obviously, you're also responsible for your customer data. It's not their responsibility. So you as a customer is responsible for the security in the cloud, where AWS is responsible for security of the cloud. Those are the two things that is very important to take from this slide. A very important reason why they brought out um, the well-architected framework is to ensure that certain design principles are maintained. This means that you need to stop guessing your capacity needs. Quite often, people go into the cloud and they see, oh, I can select huge servers, etc., um, big storage, 
but all you're going to do, you're going to escalate your cost significantly. So it uh, allows you to, to take the guesswork out of architecting your cloud implementation. It also allows you to test your systems at production scale. And we all know that in our own on-premise environments, it's quite often difficult to test our systems at production scale without affecting the existing production systems. Whereas you can create an on-demand testing environment with on the AWS platform that looks exactly the same as your um, production environment to perform tests in terms of security, in terms of scalability, without costing an arm and a leg. And then when you're done with your testing, you can just purely shut it down without it costing you additional funds from that perspective. It also allows you when you design your framework or your architecture to automate and experiment all the time. And AWS is a framework where you can automate so many of the provisioning of servers, provisioning of services, and scaling out by building those scripts that will automate most of the processes that we quite often do manually with our on-premise systems. It is also important to consider evolutionary architectures. There are certain traditional approaches that we have. We set up a database server, we set up our front end application on a set, another server or multiple servers. Whereas when we move that application to the cloud, we may decide to use some of the services already provided within the cloud, such as a cloud-based database. So we don't need to set up an additional server for that. That may even reduce your cost in the process. Another thing that this framework assists us in the design is that AWS generates data on the performance and the usage of your services in the cloud that will assist you in how you can correctly architect those services. So there's a lot of tools that will analyze your implementations and then you can drive your architectures through actual and real data that you get from the cloud. Another thing that they have is what they call game days. This is where you take your system and you stress test it. They call it game days. And that allows you to improve your architectures or your design of the system and have this constant improvement cycles you go through. As they um, uh, provide more services, etc. within the cloud, it is possible to, to say, okay, this component, we're going to switch into a different architecture or a different um, compute model because it's a new service that's available without changing anything on the actual virtual server that you're running in the cloud. It is just all of a sudden running on more powerful hardware. Or you may decide, let's, uh, we actually overestimated our requirements for that service, so let's reduce it without affecting the actual data or the access to that service that you're running in the cloud. It's sometimes very interesting um, what I like about AWS and the way they explain to customers the um, access or how their data centers are structured. Um, on AWS is divided into different what regions. Um, we have the South African region and then across the globe, um, there are currently 26 different regions, but each region has 
what they call three availability zones. And each availability zone is supported by at least two to three, or sometimes in some cases up to six physical data centers. These availability zones are uh, more or less 100 kilometers apart from one another. In, um, even in the South African region, uh, that, which is based in Cape Town, these availability zones have been created um, with the, these distances between the availability zone, so that if one zone goes down, you know that the services can continue running in another availability zone without actually impacting your application. And within each data center, um, they, with, because they have multiple data centers within each availability zone, you also have that redundancy built in. For example, if I make use of the S3 storage on AWS, um, one file is at least duplicated six times um, in case something happens on the storage. So there's a lot of redundancy that they've built into um, their cloud infrastructure. Another interesting tidbit that I would like to share, um, if you look at each data center, physical data center, has at, between at least 80,000 to 100,000 physical host servers, not virtual machines, host servers. Just to give you some idea of the sheer size of these data centers. Okay. Now, what does the well architected framework consist of? There are six pillars within the well architected framework. The first one is the operational excellence. Now, the operational excellence pillar includes the ability to support development and run workloads effectively and gain insight into their operations and to continuously improve supporting processes and procedures to deliver business value. So I will delve into each one into more details as we go along. The security pillar encompasses the ability to protect the data, the systems and assets to take advantage of cloud technologies to improve your security. If we look at the reliability pillar, the reliability pillar encompasses the ability of a workload to perform its intended function correctly and consistently when it is expected to. This includes the ability to operate and test the workload through its total life cycle. Okay. Performance efficiency. Um, this pillar includes the ability to use computing resources efficiently to meet system requirements. And then also to maintain that efficiency as demand changes and a technology evolves. Now, one thing that's very important here is the cost optimization pillar. Now, the primary um, function of this pillar is to provide the ability to run systems to deliver business value at the lowest price point. And we will delve deeper into that later on. And the final pillar is the sustainability pillar. And the sustainability pillar focuses on the environmental impacts, especially energy consumption and efficiency. So these are all levers for architects to inform direct action to reduce the resource usage. So it's very important to understand the impact and how these pillars play a role while you're architecting your framework. Now, if we, when you start to look at the first pillar, um, which is the um, operational excellence. 
there are certain components here of this pillar um, what we call design principles, the five design principles for operational excellence in the cloud. The first one is to perform operations as code. Okay. You'll be surprised how much coding you actually do in the cloud environment, scripting, building these scripts. So in the cloud, you can apply the same engineering discipline that you use for application code to your entire environment. You can define your entire environment workload, that's applications and infrastructure as code and update it with code. So without doing manual clicks and changing configurations, your entire framework i can get, create a virtual private cloud on aws and have the entire configuration defined as code and then i may want to make a small change and i just update my code and update it and it applies those changes to my environment that leads on to the next step it allows you to make frequent but small reversible changes we all know that uh, quite often on on premise environments uh, when you make a change it may be even a small change can have a big impact so we can design our workloads to permit components to be updated regularly make changes in small increments and that can be reversed if they fail without affecting your customers at all when possible. Now, another thing is it allows you to refine your operations um, procedures very frequently. As you use these operations procedures, um, you can look for opportunities to improve them all the time. You can evolve your workflow workloads, evolve your procedures, um, set up these game days to review and validate that all your procedures are effective and that all teams are familiar with these um, particular um, um, procedures. Another component that is important here with operational excellence is the anticipation of failure. This means that we perform what we call a pre-mortem not a post-mortem, but a pre-mortem. So you create exercises that, to identify potential sources of failure so that they can be removed or mitigated upfront before they actually happen. And you can test your failure scenarios and validate um, your understanding of their impact. And that is a very important aspect of operational excellence within um, uh, these uh, well-architected frameworks. Another thing that it allows you to do is to learn from all operational failures. If there was an operational failure, you can um, have certain processes to drive the improvement through lessons learned from all operational events and failures, and then share what you've learned across teams and through the entire organization. And this is what we mean by operational excellence and what this pillar means. So I'm running a bit of, out of time. I need to move it on. In terms of security, obviously, um, it allows us to build and implement a very strong identity foundation. Um, uh, one is also to maintain traceability. And there's a lot of components that allow traceability of all these components. Everything that is happening is being logged. Um, it uh, teaches you how to apply security at all layers and also automate um, your security best practices. Um, it is also very critical 
to protect data in transit and at rest. Um, also, uh, one of the design principles in security is keep people away from data. No one will ex actually access the data unless it's through authorized access through applications. And it also prepare you for security events because it's an entire component to manage these security events. When you start to talk about reliability, this is again a design list of design principles on how we automatically will recover from failure. It allows us to test our recovery procedures, ensure that these procedures are in fact working. It also, as demand increases, how, what needs to happen? Um, do we need to scale horizontally to increase the aggregate workload availability automatically? Um, reliability also ensures that we stop guessing capacity and then also manage this change in automation so that we can automatically scale out and when the demand decreases, scale back again while maintaining the same reliability and performance of the systems. Another component is the performance efficiency. Now, when we democratize advanced technologies, it allows us to make advanced technology implementation smoother by delegating complex tasks to either the cloud vendor, for example, making use of an advanced database, no SQL databases, maybe media transcoding or machine learning, and incorporate those technologies without you needing to host it or implement it within your own environment, and you can just merely consume those services within your own um, architectures. Again, it allows an organization to go global in minutes. Uh, I can deploy something in AWS and make sure that when my customers access my services, they access it with the lowest latency. They don't need to traverse the entire globe before they reach your service through the various edge services available on AWS. Another component is the use of serverless um, um, architectures. Um, if I look at making use of the Aurora database, for example, I don't need to know what server it is running on, etc. I just know I have a, Maria, a system that can run my MariaDB application. It also demands that you experiment more often, test different scenarios without affecting your production environments. And also consider mechanical sympathy. And, and that means understand how cloud services are consumed and always use the technology approach that aligns with your workload loads. For example, consider data access patterns when you select database or storage approaches. When we talk about cost of optimization, cost optimization um, means um, the concept of implementing cloud financial management. I've seen too many clients in the last two to three years rushing into the cloud just to rush out of the cloud again because all of a sudden instead of an expected 200,000 rand bill per month they got a 2 million rand bill per month because they did not make use of cost optimization within the design of the system. It, it means you are now moving into a consumption model. You only pay for the computing resources you require and increase or decrease usage depending on business requirements. Not like our traditional data centers where a certain set of computing power is always available. In the cloud, we need to 
ensure that we scale and decrease the scale based on our needs. So it is a question of um, having the tools to measure your overall um, efficiency and all these tools are available on the AWS platform and to stop spending money on undifferentiated heavy lifting. AWS does it. They take care of the racking, the stacking, the powering of the servers. It also removes operational bur bur burden of managing operating systems and applications with managed services. So there's a host of things that allow you to start to save money on certain things, but also allow you to analyze and attribute expenditure. You can actually attribute the expenditure of certain components to certain departments within your organization very quickly based on their use of these services. And the final pillar is the sustainability, where we actually look at understanding the impact you will have of your cloud implementation, how much, um, what your footprint in the cloud and the impact it will have on the environment. Um, you may have certain sustainability goals. It assists you to, design, to plan for those sustainability long-term goals. Uh, maximize the utilization. For example, it doesn't help to run two hosts running at 30% utilization, where one host running at 60% utilization um, actually will perform better and use actually less services and the footprint will be smaller. Um, also, the, uh, to anticipate and adopt new and more efficient hardware and software offerings. Constantly, hardware evolves. Um, and often, you will notice that new hardware offerings to host your virtual servers become available within the cloud. Making use of managed services means that you can work with partners such as uh, NetCV to assist you in um, managing some of these components, or for, even from AWS, depending on how you want to engage with AWS. And then lastly, reducing the downstream impact of your cloud workload. So that means reducing the amount of energy or resources required to use your services. So in conclusion, this AWS well-architected framework, it's the best practices across the six pillars for designing and operating a reliable, secure, efficient, cost-effective and sustainable systems in the cloud. And NetCB is part of the AWS partner network and we are ready to help you navigate your cloud journey. Not sure if there's been any questions. If I quickly look at that, doesn't look as if anyone had questions on this side. Well, I thank you very much for attending my session, and I hope I gave you some insight on what the cloud services is all about. Um, and then we will take it um, from there. If you have any questions, you can communicate later with me around this. I uh, thank you.